Okay, I've just started the recording of the meeting. Hello and welcome everyone now to the autumn uh, session of our Laws of Nature series. I will start uh, by giving a very short introduction, short because we have heard or maybe some of you have joined before, have uh, uh, heard this story before and, and also seen the web page. So the Law of Nature discussion series is basically um, an initiative um, to bring together physics, uh, philosophy, and mathematics uh, seminars at the moment. So we have um, usually a program that is uh, um, separated in terms of uh, autumn and spring series. For those of you uh, who have joined the spring series, you know what's going on. For the autumn series, we have another um, uh, a couple of nice uh, talks and then a nice colorful program already prepared. Uh, so we're very honored and happy to have um, uh, a couple of very distinguished uh, speakers. Um, this time also a bit more focus here and there on mathematics and also, also on philosophy. Where last time I think we had a focus more on, on, on physics. Um, uh, we'll get to the detailed uh, program later, so you can look it up on, on the web page. I will just say some general words. So this whole in initiative at the moment is organized by Angel Bassi from the University of Trieste, uh, by Wart Struve from the KU Leuven and myself. And soon after the session, also um, Paula, who will be a speaker today, will also join uh, the, the circle of, of organizers. So I think after this quick introduction, uh, Angelo, I will hand over to you to introduce the speakers and maybe also to introduce the routine uh, of how to pose questions uh, and how the whole uh, structure is organized. So thanks everybody for joining in again and see so many of you. Um, um, hope. You had a well summertime, some well-deserved holidays, and let's get back to business, Angelo. Thank you, Dirk, and welcome everybody. So as you've seen from the website, we have two speakers today, uh, Paula schumer Reicher. apologies for the wrong, horrible pronunciation, <laughs> Paula for short. <laughs> she will talk about the arrows of time without a past hypothesis, and then Shalom Goldstein, uh, from Rutgers University, and he will talk about the distinction between past and future. So the talks will be 40, they have, a, they have the standard format of 45 plus 15 minute, minute, minute question, and there will be a discussion uh, at the end, which will uh, involve uh, both, uh, uh, both talks and general questions about the subject. Typically, let's say that we leave the speaker uh, talk, but you can pose questions in the chat, and then in case if, if they're urgent, so to say, we can, uh, we, uh, I can ask them. Uh, otherwise, we can have a discussion at the end of the talk. Am I missing anything, Dirk, about the... I think that's okay, except maybe for the after two talks are over, we have uh, a bit more informal round of uh, discussion where um, then everybody can just raise the hand on Zoom and in, in the order of, of um, yeah, uh, you, you raise the hands, uh, Andrew will probably call out uh, you to open the microphone and just ask your question directly so we have a bit more vivid uh, discussion. Okay. But I would also say maybe more technical and really questions that are very urgent for the understanding uh, um, of the talks in the chat during the talks and uh, and uh, keep maybe the, the more general question that could be interested uh, um, to discuss, uh, interesting to discuss in a whole round to the end. Thank you, Dirk. So we can start. No, Paula, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you for the introduction. And let's see. Angela, you haven't introduced her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so as you can see from the first slide. Oh, yes. That Paola. was the general introduction. <laughs> Ah, so the, I, the full name was much worse for me to pronounce, but now it's the short version is That's easier. Call call call. So the title of the talk is "The Arrows of Time Without Past Without a Past Hypothesis." Please. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so, as the title suggests, I will talk about um, yeah, well, how to obtain the arrow of time without a past hypothesis. So what is the error of time? Basically, well, we start with irreversible processes. We experience irreversible processes all along in everyday life. 
when we pour milk into the coffee or when the gas is revealed from some from some, some container, then we experience the that there occurs a time asymmetric irreversible process. So this is a process which goes on only in one direction of time. This irreversibility corresponds to an increase in entropy as described by the second law of thermodynamics. And this in fact is a time asymmetric macroscopic law despite the fact that the underlying molecular or atomic uh, dynamics is time symmetric. So where then does the time asymmetry come from? Where does this area of time, as we call it, this directionality come from? And this is a very important question also from a philosophical point of view as almost any law, so any fundamental law in physics is time symmetric. Why then do we still experience an asymmetry in time? And also, as most of you know, many people they believe that we can also um, ground all the psychological errors of time, like that we have records and um, that we know about the past, but not of the future, that we can ground it on this thermodynamic error of time. So we are now interested in where this asymmetry comes from. And there has been a famous paper by Sheldon Goldstein, who will talk afterwards um, on the problem of irreversibility, and he distinguishes between the easy and hard part of this problem. And I will shortly um, recollect the ideas regarding the easy part of the problem, which is essentially Boltzmann's work, and then come to the hard part, which is much more, well, let's say, speculative on the one side, but also connected to mathematical facts, which I will show. Okay, so Boltzmann has already told us um, that at the heart of the problem, there is, well, I will focus a bit on the, on the main point. So one point in, at the heart of the problem is the distinction between the micro and macro um, description of the same system. So the macro system is um, just a system of a huge number of particles. So for a system of everyday life, 10 to the 24 about Avogadro's number. And this system is described by thermodynamic variables, volume, pressure, and so on. And these variables, they determine macroscopically distinct states, the macrostates, mi. And that way, they provide a macro partition m. First of all, this is just a thermodynamic partition. And then when we come to the micro description, this really gives us a partition on phase space into regions of different size where if every region um, is connected to a particular macrostate as determined by these variables. So now we come to the microsystem. The microsystem is just a system of n Newtonian particles. We can best describe it as a Hamiltonian system. So we have here phase space, which is the state space made up of points, which are the positions and momenta, summarize the positions and momenta of all the particles. We have here the set of measurable states and regions, subregions of phase space, and we have a flow and a measure. And this flow, the Hamiltonian phase flow, is conserved when we take here the Liouville measure, or as we will later do the microcanonical measure when we come to a constant energy hypersurface. So anyway, this is a very nice system, and we can say a lot about it. So we have here the Hamiltonian dynamics. We have a point in phase space. We have a vector field. At, the, at every point, there is a vector which is determined here by the well-known form from the Hamiltonian. So we have a point, we have a vector, and the flow, is, the flow lines are just the trajectories. They are just the integral curves along the Hamiltonian vector field. So this is what we know. And we also know that the Liouville measure by Liouville theorem is the conserved measure of that system. It's a perfect measure of phase space volume. It's essentially the six and dimensional Lebesgue measure such as a volume measure, and it's conserved under the Hamiltonian time evolution. So we can measure the volume of regions. And when we come to systems which, in which energy is conserved or almost conserved, we, can, uh, we find that the trajectories are um, constrict, restricted to the constant energy hypersurface, the gamma E. And we have here the microcanonical measure, which is just 
um, well, really we measure restricted to that to that surface, and it is again conserved by the Liouville theorem. And so we can naturally introduce the notion of a time evolved measure mu t, which is just given by the Urbild, the original image of the set. And this is, this is the same. So mu of some set A is mu t of A. So we have really a stationary measure or conserved measure, or yeah, like it is called. And stationarity is one of the uh, main features of Boltzmann's statistical mechanics and is a very, um, also a very strong feature because we really get a lot from this as we will see later on. And one other thing uh, which is important in Boltzmann's conceptual uh, framework is the notion of typicality. So these are the two main notions, stationarity of the measure and typicality. Typicality of the equilibrium stage, which, uh, which we will come to now. So now consider again the framework. We have the microstate X is just a point in, in, in phase space, one possible state of the system. And we have a macrostate MI of X corresponds to some macro region gamma MI. This is a subregion of phase space with a certain phase space volume. Let's write it like this, given as the microcanonical measure of that region. So we really have determined by the thermodynamic variables, we have a certain region in phase space, the set of all microstates which realize that microstate, MI. And we say the state is typical if its measure, so it's normalized measure when we take compare it to the phase space, so this should be normalized, is about one. And it's atypical if it's about zero. So it's a typical state if it is almost as large as phase space itself and atypical otherwise. And the notion of typicality here is notably time independent as the measure is stationary. So this makes it a very powerful notion, so to say. And for um, now it has been shown or it has been argued by Boltzmann and also later by different people like Landford and so on, that for all reasonable macro partitions and all macroscopic systems, there exists a dominant region gamma M equilibrium, which is almost as large as the entire constant energy hypersurface. And this region is called the equilibrium region and the corresponding macro state is called the equilibrium state. So this is Boltzmann equilibrium. And here we come to the typicality of the equilibrium state. So equilibrium is really the typical state of the system. And um, this explains also Boltzmann's notion of entropy. Here's the famous formula for the Boltzmann entropy. The Boltzmann entropy of a certain state MI is just essentially the logarithm of, of the measure, phase space measure of the state. And um, this means just as a remark that small differences in the entropy really correspond to huge differences in the phase space volumina. And thus to huge differences in the likeliness whether a state is typical or not. And we really find that the equilibrium state where we have, well, a measure which is almost as large as, as the measure of the entire phase space, this is a state of maximal entropy. This is a typical state of the system. And here we have a drawing of Roger Penrose. So I have some pictures from Roger Penrose's group because they are so extremely nice, I think. And Maybe you know it. So the equilibrium region, which is here, it's called epsilon, is almost as large as um, phase space itself. And Boltzmann's entropy is also defined for non-equilibrium states, like for the small state, it would then be a very low entropy state. And for a trajectory, which is in phase space, and which is in that um, low entropy state, well, which is in such a small, tiny region, then it's in a low entropy state. And then when the trajectory is in, in here, it's in the maximum, in the equilibrium state, in the maximum entropy state. So actually, we already get a lot from this um, two things, typicality of the equilibrium state and stationarity of the measure. So what we get is that typically systems are in equilibrium where entropy is maximal and they stay in equilibrium for almost all of their time. 
for all the time, essentially, except for rare fluctuations. And the directionality or time asymmetry enters only when the system starts from a highly unlikely low entropy initial state. Starting from that state, the system typically evolves into equilibrium, whereby entropy increases rather quickly. So essentially what Boltzmann did was he explained the asymmetry given a time, given a time symmetric law by an asymmetry on boundary conditions. So there's an initial state of low entropy, which is in itself extremely unlikely. So we start with an atypical initial macro state, but typically starting from that state, um, the trajectory runs into equilibrium rather quickly. And this is clear as, um, well, we get this from the stationarity starting from such a low entropy state, it would only very few trajectories can actually come from regions of even smaller phase space volume because volume is conserved. So almost all, well, they have to, essentially they have to come from and have to go to equilibrium rather quickly. So all we really need is an atypical low entropy state to begin with. And this is known as the typicality account. And there have been many works on this. So it's Boltzmann himself, but also by Joe Leibovitz, by Penrose, by Brickmore, by Goldstein. Um, yeah, the name typicality account is mainly used in philosophy, I think. And yeah, it's a very nice explanation. And here we also have a very nice picture where we see, okay, given we are in non-equilibrium now in such a very tiny region, then, um, well, the trajectory, a typical trajectory will move towards, will go into equilibrium rather soon and well, the same to the other side. So now, again, we see that the asymmetry comes in only when we, so to say, cut here and have we're really in a typical initial state to begin with, but nothing to that side. And we will now see that, um, well, coming to the universe, well, when we start here, imagine this is just a subsystem, then we might wonder, okay, we cut here, we have a low entropy initial state, where does this state come from? And we, when we consider the system as part of a larger system, we will find that it must come from an, another even lower entropy state from that larger system. And eventually we end up with the universe as a whole where we find that eventually, well, all the low entropy states, they must eventually come from a low entropy state in the beginning of the universe. And this is what is known as the past hypothesis. So the name I, has been coined by David Albert in his book, but it's already mentioned in the conceptual way by Feynman, also by Penrose. And this is the drawing again of Roger Penrose where God takes a very special initial macro state of the universe, which he estimates to be of about one to the 10 to the 10 to the 123 as compared to the equilibrium state, which is an incredibly small number. Okay. So this is, I would say the standard way. There is one um, thing I wanted to remark. There are of course, there is of course another, another possibility, which is the fluctuation scenario. This has already been suggested by Boltzmann um, Boltzmann suggested both scenarios. So one is the scenario where we have a big bang, a low entropy state in the beginning and entropy is increasing ever since and then goes to equilibrium to some maximum. And we are somewhere on the way up. The other idea is to have really an eternal evolution and Boltzmann was more inclined, I think, to an eternal evolution and not to a beginning in time, which at that time people didn't believe in. And then we have some fluctuations from time to time and also sometimes a fluctuation which is quite large and we are somewhere on the way up. Actually, Boltzmann also thought we might be on the other side. So he wouldn't distinguish between entropy uh, decrease and increase as he says, like most people say that the past is always where we find the low entropy state. And um, then there is some discussion about why are we not at the bottom of that fluctuation. So 
by statistics, we should be at the bottom because smaller fluctuations are much, I mean, we should be at the deepest point of the fluctuation because statistically to the past entropy should have been increasing also. Well, but we might apply some kind of self-location hypothesis instead of a past hypothesis saying that we are just far away from that point. So anyway, we need a special postulate to really explain that we observe um, the increase of entropy in our universe. And this is, um, I would say, the status of the past hypothesis now. So simply, most people simply accept the past hypothesis as a postulate on the initial conditions, on the initial conditions of the universe, in addition to the physical laws. So I would say Feynman and Penrose and most physicists of today adopt the past hypothesis as this kind of additional postulate. There's also the, in philosophy, there's also the stance of Jungian metaphysics in the sense of David Lewis, where they make the past hypothesis as part of the best system account of laws. So it's essentially an additional law. So we have the micro laws and we have the usual dynamic laws. And then we have the past hypothesis as so to say another law, which together with the rest makes it the best. So the simplest and most informative description of everything. And here I think we can cite um, David Albert in very lower with the mentaculous vision. But then there are also physicists who try to get rid of the past hypothesis entirely. And this has been done only recently and find, try to find a way in which the error of time comes out typically as a feature of a typical universe. So without reference to any additional hypothesis at all. And that's Carol and Chen from 2004 and five. I would say it's also Penrose with his conformal cyclic cosmology. Although I won't say anything about that. And it's Barbara Koslowski and Mercati from 2013, 14 and 15. Um, I won't say anything about that proposal as it is works with some kind of entropy reduction after black holes have formed. And I don't know if it's quite only speculative or if there is something behind it, which anyway, I don't know. I will say a little bit about Carol and Chen, and then I will mainly discuss this proposal, which is also connected um, to a full analysis of the n-body problem. And I will connect this relation and analysis, analysis they have of the n-body problem to an absolute analysis, which I have uh, performed together with um, Dustin Lazarovich. Okay. <clears throat> so Carol, he was the first to propose the following. following. <clears throat> well, he put in question the whole picture, which was drawn by Penrose, of phase space being finite and of the universe having an equilibrium state. So what if for the universe, there simply exists no equilibrium state, then entropy can grow with a bounds in both directions from some point of minimal entropy. And we have an error of time typically, well, everywhere we have an error of time apart from the minimum. Mm. So this is why Kara and Chen, they propose an eternal universe or rather multiverse as they do it because they have a very well speculative picture in mind with baby universes getting born and so one of the other, so to say, which accounts for the fact that we don't know at which point we are on the curve because at any point, I mean, there is a new baby universe, a new baby universe and so on. So it's essentially to hype effect where we are on that curve. And the overall, there is a U-shaped entropy curve. So Carol suggests that we don't need the past hypothesis because we are somewhere on that curve and there isn't an error of time. So point. But what is the necessary condition for this reasoning is that we have an infinite phase space or an infinite um, constant energy hyperplane, sorry. And the problem with this is that then the phase space volume measure is non-normalizable. And how then can we have a statistical analysis of this? You may think that we don't need a statistical analysis because 
anywhere on that curve, there is an error of time. But I mean, comparing this to the fluctuation scenario where we have um, the problem that we should not be close to the minimum of the fluctuation because otherwise we have no past. Um, well, we, we might run into the same problem here. So we should be somewhere up the curve. And somehow we should exclude this region in here because we don't want to be close to the minimum. We experience that we really have a past that dinosaurs have lived before us, that the universe has been ordered in the past. And well, we would somehow like to say, well, we are not in, in close vicinity of this read of this minimum. And I think we cannot really do because we have the non-normalizable measure to begin with. And then any statistics is ambiguous. Although there might be a way to argue around, there is also this paper here, which I suggest um, as giving reasons for why epistemically you should still um, take this model as a good model and not worry about this. Um, well, also Carrie says, Carol says that the past is where the low entropy state is. And in both directions of higher entropy, this is what we experience as the future. So we might be on either side of this curve. So now let's come to a more realistic version of our more realistic model of our universe. And there are two models, actually. There's the Newtonian model and there's the GR model. So Newtonian model is just n particles in three-dimensional Euclidean space moving according to the Newtonian force law. And we can look at this in the absolute Newtonian description or in a more relational Leibnizian or Machian description on shape space. We will do both. And we will find, okay, we have a Liouville measure on, in the absolute description and also in relational phase space, at least to some point. And then in the GR model, on, on the other hand, well, things are quite similar. We won't turn into the discussion of the GR, but everything is quite similar because when we formulate the um, it in the ADM formalism, which is a Hamiltonian kind of formalism, we again find that there is a, um, a measure. So for example, the simplest model is a mini superspace model, which is in the ADM formalism, just a Hamiltonian model with scale factor A, scalar field phi for the matter distribution homogeneous and isotropic, and we have the conjugate momenta P A and P phi. And this, these, they also have these um, formalism. Also, we have here a symplectic structure, and also we have a volume form and kind of a Liouville measure, which is constructed just like in the standard Hamiltonian case. This is sometimes called the GHS measure because it goes back to a paper by Giddens, Hawking, and Stewart from 1989 where they construct the measure from the canonical symplectic structure of the theory. But usually, well, it is done for very simplified models like the mini superspace model where only the scale factor, so to say, is the interesting thing telling us something about the size of the universe and where we don't have so many degrees of freedom in the matter field. So I think the n-body model, which, is, which can also be discussed in details, is the more interesting case. Um, so what about the measure in the n-body problem? At first we might think we couldn't can construct it just like Boltzmann did and do it just in analogy to the microcanonical measure and look what comes out. So we have the gravitational n-body system in infinite three-dimensional space. We have the Hamiltonian, which is here the kinetic term and the Newton potential, the, this term. And what we find immediately is that microcanonical measure diverges. So it's non normalizable, even if we restrict the n particles to some finite volume V. So even if we don't think of the particles being in infinite space, still for n larger or equal to three, the measure of the region of some, well, V and n, here the microcanonical measure diverges. Um, I think this result is known for some while already. I don't know who, who has had it first. But, um, well, here we have a divergence in the momenta coming from the fact that 
The Newton potential is a one over R potential and as the particles come close together, the system heats up and um, the momenta can essentially grow without bound. So it may heat up without bound due to this gravitational interaction. And if instead of the finite volume V, we, so we release the particles from the container, so to say, we take the infinite space R3, then of course we have a divergence both in the position and in the momentum part of this integral. Um, this is similar in GR, at least when, um, what regards the scale factor A. As the scale factor is unbounded, the measure is typically non-normalizable. And this leads to all kinds of ambiguities in statistics. And there is a paper by Schifrin and Walt who really analyzed different proposals for, let's say people discuss whether inflation is likely or not to occur. Then they show that all these discussions, um, well, they are ambiguous as long as the scale factor A is still in the, in the measure because depending on the way you, you make a cutoff or you somehow normalize the measure, so to say by hand, you get different results. So non-normalizability really is a problem for the analysis. And still what one might do about the entropy is one may define it redefine it, so to say, that it always um, refers to finite macro regions, the so macro regions of finite volume. And this is one idea that um, Dustin Lazarovich and I uh, worked out in um, 2019. It's when you define the entropy, well, in the standard way, it's not well defined because the measure, microcanonical measure diverges, but you can now adjust the macro variables and really um, choose instead of, let's say, assume we are again in infinite space, instead of infinite space, you take here an internal an intrinsic measure of the size of the system, which is the moment of inertia, the center of mass moment of inertia. So as you see, this intrinsically measures the volume of the, of the system of n, n particles without reference to absolute to, to the external um, infinite space. And then um, you need another thing to do. So when you really introduce as a second micro variable, what we call U, it's minus the Newton potential. So it's the absolute value of the Newton potential. Well, then this tells you something about, um, well, how much the system has about the temperature of the system, you could say, or about the clustering of the system. So when people, uh, when, when particles are close to each other, then the U is large. And also, so um, since overall energy is conserved, also the kinetic energy of the entire system is large. So this is both the measure of clustering and of heating up of the system. And this is a measure of the size of the system. So these, for the gravitational system, we say are reasonable macro variables to, to consider. And when you really look at the microcanonical measure, so the phase space measure for macro states of constant u and i, which is just this here, so you integrate over this with these delta functions. So we have total energies conserved. We look at a state, at a macro state of some fixed u and some fixed i, so some fixed clustering and some fixed size. Well, we obtain the following bounds. We couldn't um, calculate this explicitly, so we had to acknowledge a bit of a, um, yeah, where we considered the u plus minus delta u and the i plus minus delta i. Then we obtained the following bounds. Um, which are essentially, well, the E plus, um, e plus U to the three and a half, which is like the um, kinetic energy term. And we have the I to the three and a half on both sides. So the measure is approximately just um, um, proportional to the size and also to the 
amount of clustering or to the amount of temperature of the system. And one might define such an entropy. Of course, this is just a proposal for a certain choice of microvariables. It's not said here that this is the correct choice, so to say, but well, it shows us that the larger the system is and the more it is clustered and heated up, heat, um, yeah, then the larger the phase space volume. And this would mean that in a system we have in mind, like in the n body system, this would really mean that the entropy can grow without bounds with respect to this definition. This would exactly quantify Penrose conjecture about the entropy increase in gravitating system. So here's the famous picture of him, where you see that where he suggests that entropy increase in the gravitating system is quite the opposite to the gas in the box. So in the gas, entropy increases when particles spread, and this is like the maximal entropy state. In the gravitating system, he suggests that entropy increases just the opposite. So this is a low entropy state, and the more the system clusters, the larger the entropy. That would correspond to, well, our notion of entropy proposed above would correspond to this picture. And we see, in fact, in the, in the, in the positive or zero energy problem, so the n-body system with positive or zero total energy, and zero angular momentum, we find really that, um, well, the evolution of I and U is the way, is quite a U-shaped. So in fact, what we find is, we have from the roche Kubi equation, we find that the I is, so the size of the system is, um, is the I of T is essentially a U-shaped curve. So there's some point at which, this, at which the particles are closest and in both directions away from that, the, part, the system expands. And at the same time, yeah, so it expands to infinity. And at the same time, another notion which I want to introduce at this point, the shape complexity, um, also has a similar form. So before we were talking about I and U, and now I want to switch essentially to um, a new variable, which is the shape complexity. It's square root of I times U. This is an interesting variable. And it will also lead us to the relational analysis because it is independent of scale. So it's essentially the largest distance interparticle distance divided by the smallest interparticle distance. You see the U, which is a Newton potential is like one over R, small r, and the skirt of I behaves like large R, like this largest distance. This shape uh, macro variable, so one could call it, well, for this, we know that, that also it goes to infinity as t goes to plus minus infinity. So there is a minimum both of this complexity function at the point where the particles are closest. So approximately at the point where the particles are closest where large r and small r are about the same. So for the zero energy case, we can essentially um, rewrite the entropy function from above in this form, so we had here before the i and here the e plus u, the e is zero, so we have here only the u. We, we now take the one squared of i to the u and make it to the cs, and here we have the squared of i. So we essentially have, um, well, these results from the n-body literature um, ground um, the idea that entropy defined like this is really a curve which has a minimum at a particular point where the complexity and the system size are minimal and it increases in both directions away from that. And also numerical data um, tell us more about uh, the complexity and this is, here we come to some numerical data which have been plotted by Julian Barber and his group. So in the approach of Julian Barber and Tim Koslowski and Flavio Mercati, they really 
consider only the complexity and they say they have here the, um, from the numerical data for 1000 particles, we find that the complexity really has a minimum at some point and it grows in both directions away from that point. And this would be a schematic sketch for the evolution of the n-body problem. So we have here a minimum, minimal size of the system. And here we find that with time in both directions, particles get away from each other, but they also form Kepler pairs, some galaxies and so on. And um, well, if we took the notion of entropy from above, from absolute space, we would have here a low entropy state and here a larger entropy state, a high entropy state. Now, when we turn to the um, relational approach from Julian Barber and this group, they suggest that we should try to get rid of scale entirely, or at least as much as we can, as we can, and instead consider the complexity gradient. You see here the gradient, which they also call the gravitational error of time. Consider this as fundamental instead of an entropy gradient, instead of a thermodynamic error of time. And let this grant the second law. So basically, just from the complexity gradient, we find that subsystems are created, which again, give rise to thermodynamic errors within the subsystems. But on the larger um, scale, on the scale of the universe, I mean, on the level of the universe, it's just the complexity, which is important. And um, they also call this the Janus point scenario where we have a Janus point. So with two phases, with two, um, error, two errors of time. So the Janus point is here, the minimum of the complexity function, and we have an arrow. So it's the common past and an arrow in this direction and an arrow in that direction. So one past, two future scenario. And they ground this on, on the relational analysis of the Newtonian system. So let's um, look at this. So what we do is we really consider the Newtonian universe of zero total energy, zero momentum, linear and angular momentum. And in fact, we do this well for Leibnizian or Machian reasons that we say, okay, for the universe as a whole, I am, these are the conserved quantities and they assume to be zero. And we look how far we get now with the phase space reduction and reduction of the dynamics in this case. So the three-body case has been done explicitly by Babo Koslovsky Nakati in the two papers, and the n-body case has, is also in a paper by Flavio Nakati and myself from this year. So let's see, we start again from the n-body system. We have here the Hamiltonian and we have the conserved quantities. So that's clear. We have total energy, linear and angular momentum, and we set them equal to zero. This means, so this is our model of the universe. This means that we can gauge fixed the overall position and orientation because these are the generators of translation and rotation. So when they are zero, we can simply fix the orientation, the overall orientation and position of the, of the universe, which I think is very natural to do as we don't believe that the universe is different when it's one meter to the left or to the right or well like this. And we find that there exists reduced Hamiltonian dynamics on that reduced phase space. The reduced phase space T star S here it's still with one scale degree of freedom inside. That's why I put the R here. The reduced phase space is the cotangent bundle of the reduced configuration space, which is just the normal configuration space Q quotient by the Euclidean group of three-dimensional translations and rotations. And in the next step, what can be done in the, um, in the relational description is, well, we have now one degree, one absolute degree of freedom left, which is scale. So the overall size of the system. And we have one generator of scalings, which is the dilation and momentum. Now notice that the dilation and momentum D which is defined here is just the time derivative of 
i and i was a u-shaped curve so i of t was just like this like a parabola the size of the system with a minimum at the Janus point where a minimum where this is the particles are closest and that's the point d equals zero and d being the first time derivative is simply monotonic it goes from minus infinity to plus infinity so just take it as an internal time parameter and in fact since at the same time d is the generator of scalings when we go to the hypersurface of zero energy and um, d equals zero we can essentially um, write the equations of motion with, with respect to this d and we find ourselves on shape phase space in the end and um, this is because d is a generator of scalings at the same time so we essentially find that we can rewrite the equations with um, remnants of scale in the d um, dependence of the shape Hamiltonian on shape phase space. So we construct it just the usual way. So as a conjugate of D, given the energy constraint. So we find that the shape Hamiltonian, depending on the remaining shape variables. So these are the angles between the particles. So now there's no scale anymore, but only like for three particles, we just have two angles, which describe the triangle shape. And here we have the conjugate shape momenta. And well, it's of that form. Here again, um, one can do this for n particles. So we have three n minus seven um, angles, three n minus seven, because from the three n position variables, when we go to the relational space, we take off three variables which fix the orientation, three which fix the position, and one which fixes the overall scale of the system. And then we have here the conjugate momenta. And um, we find where well, we can explicitly write down the dynamics on shape phase space T star S, which is obtained from shape space S. So S is just the quotient of ordinary configuration space by the similarity group trans of translations, rotations, and scalings. And well, what we obtain is another Hamiltonian system. So everything has been canonical. So these transformations have all been canonical. And we have still um, now a reduced phase space, shape phase space. We have a shape Hamiltonian. We have a reduced Liouville measure, which is constructed just as usual, the uniform volume measure on that space. And this is still a stationary measure. So this is quite a relational, well, a reduced description, but quite analogous to what we had before in absolute phase space. Only that now we have only angles in the description, what regards the position variables, but we have the shape momenta and the shape momenta, they still can increase without bounds. So this measure is still, well, this is a non-normalizable measure. Stationary, but non-normalizable. Okay, so when we write down the Hamiltonian n body shape phase space, so not for three particles, but for n particles, we can write it down in an explicit form, which is of this form. You find here the shape momenta um, in here, and you also find here the D. So it's a D dependent dynamics. So, so to say, well, the remnants of scale, which is not an absolute scale in the sense that. At this moment, the scale is this, this and that, but it's like the D, it tracks, so to say, the relational scale. So how far are we from the point of minimal size, so to say? So the difference of um, sizes, so to say, is still tracked in here. Um, okay, so this is the full dynamics. So we have here the shape momenta, we have here the shape potential, the shape potential Ds, depends only on the angles between the particles and it's connected to the Newton potential Vn via the formula. Well, it's Vn is the shape potential divided by square root of i and i was, you know, the intrinsic size of the, the moment of inertia. So this is 
this is a length variable and it's just the size of the system, so to say. And we can write on the equations of motion on T star S, so on shape phase space, which is not maybe as nice as on absolute phase space, but we can write it down explicitly. And we find here the term from the shape potential. And well, exactly. Yeah. Now let's have a look at how this looks when we draw a picture on shape space. And this picture is taken from Julian Barber's um, paper where we have really now a picture of phase space of the three body phase space. So not for n particles, we cannot draw. But for three particles, we have here, every point is just a different triangle shape. And we have the equilateral triangle at the, at the up, at the bottom and the top. And we have here on the equator, the collinear configurations. So we have here the Euler configurations with three particles at equal distances on a line. We have here the binary collision points where one Kepler pair has formed and one particle separates from the Kepler pair. Yeah, and all the, other, um, all the others in between. And what is plotted here is the level sets for the, for the shape potential Vs, which is also just minus the shape complexity. This is another way in which the shape complexity, which we have learned of, is important as this is arises as the minus the shape potential. And we find here, well, it's largest at, at the points at which two particles almost or collide and the other particle gets away of it. And it's its minimum where we have the equilateral triangle. Um, yeah, and now look at the typical word, generic trajectory. Just start with some point here, the cross, where we start with some generic initial data. And then we find that in one direction, the trajectory moves towards the, well, this is also the shape potential down the potential well, and also in the other direction, which is the yellow line, it moves towards these attractors in shape space, which are given by, well, where the complexity is largest. So when we go here, complexity increases in both directions and well, down the potential well of the shape potential. And similar picture seems to exist also for the n body case, also we have no plot nor, but also there we have like um, subregions of larger complexity, which act as attractors in shape space. Um, so I must hurry up. So now the last point is, well, I mean, so far, um, what is happening here is we find already here, when we analyze the volume measure on shape phase space, we find, okay, let's start with a certain region on shape space and look what happens to all the points in that region as they evolve in time. Well, they all go to the attractor, to one of the three attractors. So essentially the shape volume decreases, but since we are in shape phase space and we have a stationary measure on that space, the volume in the shape momenta increases at the very same time. So overall volume is conserved but the shape the volume decreases and the momentum in the momentum part, the volume increases. So now there is a, what I think is the crucial step in this model. And it also appears to be the crucial step in the general relativistic case with respect to the scale factor. Um, it's to take into account the dynamical similarity of the system. So what is dynamical similarity? Dynamical similarity is um, the invariance of the solutions under a global transformation of all the positions, momenta and time. And this has already been described in Landau and Lifshitz. It's part of any dynamics which has a homogeneous potential like here the Newton potential. So this is already the form in which the dynamical similarity applies to the Newtonian potential to the Newton potential. In that case, it's of that form. So when essentially what it means is that there exist solutions or trajectories, which are 
different in size, but geometrically they look the same. And they are only different in overall size. And when run through with a different velocity and with time adapted accordingly, well, then they are undistinguishable. So it's another invariance, global invariance of the equations of motion, so to say, under this uh, transformation. And when taking relationalism seriously, we should really um, identify all these solutions. They form an equivalence class according to this transformation. And um, um, let us identify these solutions. This, when we come to shape space, to the, when we come to the point where shape phase space actually where we are, then this dynamical similarity translate because we have already done some manipulation with the, um, with the coordinates, it translates in, in this transformation. So because the angles, the angles, they don't depend on the scale. So we don't have here the, the so to say the scaling transformation but we only keep it in the shape momenta and also in the dilation and momentum, which is our time parameter on shape phase space. So the equations of motion on shape phase space, they are invariant under these transformations. Some people say it's like an additional symmetry, although it is somehow different than the symmetries we had, we had before. But still, okay, if we want to take this out, we should really try to identify the solutions which um, connect to each other under this transformation. And what is the hard part is that it's also scaling of time. So we really have, like this looks like we have to identify different points at different times. But where it is easy to do is at the moment at which D is equal to zero. So, um, well, first step is instead of this, shape momenta, we look at spherical coordinates. So spherical shape momentum coordinates, we have here the radial component, which should also have in it some dependence on the metric on shape space, but actually we don't care about the metric. So I left it out because it won't en enter in the, or it won't change the result in the end. So here we have, so to say the radial component of the shape momentum vector, the length of the shape momentum vector. And here we have the new angles psi one to psi three and minus eight, which are just the angles between the shape momenta. So the angles between pi one and pi two and so on. And we have here just the length of the shape momentum vector, which we knew can still grow without bound. But now we see when we take into account the dynamical similarity, we can really fix this length at the point D equals zero because this transformation at the point, the, uh, well, this transformation becomes this transformation, the angles, the shape momentum back of the shape momentum back, so they transform without any scaling and the radial component scales and also the D of course. But at D equals zero, we can just fix this length of the vector and we can really get to the relational distinct midpoint data so it's the data at d equals zero of relationally distinct solutions, also dynamically distinct by this dynamical similarity. We call it PT star S as it is some kind of projectized um, cotangent bundle of shape space. And it's just, well, the set of points for which this vector, shape momentum vector is fixed to some constant. And we find that on that space, we have some normalizable volume measure as it is a compact space, which somehow depends here, with the sigma depends here of some function of the phi k of the shaped um, variables. This can also depend on the metric, but it's not, well, some dependence, which we're not so much interested in. And then we have just the d phi one, to d phi is three and minus seven. So the three and minus seven angles which describe the system and then the deep psi one to deep psi three and minus eight. The, um, well, the angular part of the shape momentum vector here. What can we learn from that measure? And this is, I think, um, already a message which has been 
for the Sribadi case, um, which has been seen in the by Julian Barber in this group, is well, let's analyze, let's take as a macro variable on shape phase space the complexity, which, which is scale invariant, so it's a good macro variable on that space. And we look, we distinguish between small shape complexity, which are essentially for the three particles, it's like the equilateral triangle, but for more particles, it's just a very homogeneous distribution. And we distinguish this macro state from a macro state where the shape complexity is large. So this would correspond to a state where we have clusters or Kepler pairs and galaxies far from each other. So essentially a very inhomogeneous distribution. And we look what this measure tells us, then we find that, well, we know from the dynamics that goes towards plus and minus infinity, the CS goes to infinity. This was also the numerical result we had in the beginning. But we find that at D equals zero, among the relationally distinct midpoint data, we really have the measure of states of small or close to minimal complexity. Um, oh, sorry. There is a mistake in here, I think. Um, that's because I changed the measures is about, oh, can I, I cannot, I think, can I comment it in here? No. Well, this should be an about approximately sign. So the measure, um, so it's not much smaller, but the measure of these states, so of minimal complexity is almost as large as the entire measure of that entire um, space of midpoint data. So typically at D equals zero, what we find is that the universe is dense and homogeneous. So somewhat like the Big Bang, um, according to that relational measure. And from the dynamics, we find that the complexity increases as T goes to plus minus infinity. So when we consider back um, to the entropy notion, which we had above, what we find essentially, well, is such a homogeneous distribution appeared to us in absolute space as a low entropy distribution, as a low entropy macro state. And now we find that this low entropy state, when we consider the relational distinct midpoint data is just a very typical state of the system. Mm. So what about the relational statistical analysis as there are some points I wanted to mention, so this is like the before last slide. Before the dynamical similarity has been taken into account, we had a stationary but non normalized Liouville measure for the gravitational system, so geometrically constructed from this eclectic two form and so on. Stationary but not normalizable. After dynamical similarity has been taken into account, we have a normalizable but non stationary measure. We can also construct it geometrically from the contact volume formats and so on. In fact, non-stationary means that as we said, as I said, or as I mentioned before is when we really restrict the dynamics to this compact space after taking dynamical similarity into account, we can do that. But then we have a time evolved measure, which is not conserved and this measure for some measurable region A at D equals zero, we have some A. Well, when we look at this, the measure increases for D from minus infinity to zero, it's maximal at the point D equals zero and decreases afterwards. So essentially the shape volume is gained and lost again. And it seems that a similar result for the measure with respect to this dynamical similarity transformation holds in general relativity as well. At least this is how I understood the papers from David Sloan and John Grip, um, who really look at this in the case of, let's say the mini superspace model or some model, including the scale factor, which they can also normalize by this dynamical similarity, but then the measure which they get is non-normalized. So just as a remark, the dynamically distinct solutions, well, once we have figured out which they are, we can re-embed them in absolute or 
well, in, in some higher level phase space. And look how they behave there. And in that, um, well, absolute the relational phase space, we, we have a stationary measure. So we might look at the re embedding and find out about how they evolve through that phase space in there and just restrict the attention to this set of solutions, which we have figured out to be dynamically distinct. Well, I would say this is some future work which one could do in this approach to really understand what happens to the evolution of phase space regions in absolute as compared to really, well, this last relational approach. And this is just a picture of the universe, how it might look like if we have one past and two futures. And that's the end. Thank you. Okay, very. Thank you, Paula. Are there some questions? So thank you very much for the talk. And uh, I see claps, people clapping. I don't know if there are some uh, questions. Um, yeah, there is one, there is, I think that to Serge, I suppose, Aristarov. Yeah, it was, it was I, me, yes. Hello. So probably one quick question, and then we move to Shelley. We leave the rest, the, the rest of the discussion to later. Paolo, could you please repeat how you fixed sigma? So what what is it exactly? Which measure? Well, <clears throat> you have the um, on shape phase space. You still have the well. You have all the angles which describe the shape of the system, and you have the conjugate momenta. Mm -hmm. But these conjugate momenta, they can st still increase without bounds. They are unbounded. Mm -hmm. No, I understood and that you used dynamical similarity, but after that, you had you had the, the new space, which was P S uh, T star S. Yeah, that was when I fixed the length of the shape momentum vector. Yes. And I could okay. do that mm -hmm. at D equals zero because the dynamical similarity, I don't know, maybe I should. Yeah, that I understood. I just wanted to there um, on this on this reduced very reduced mm -hmm. space after you already have taken the dynamical similarity into account you then have taken some measure which yeah, that which, measure well mm -hmm. that essentially that's just by well i obtained it from the Liouville measure from before just by a delta function where i uh, fixed yeah, okay. the length of the shape momentum thanks. Yes, it's just the good. project mm -hmm. measure yes mm -hmm. thanks Okay, thank you for the question. Thank you also for the answer. I think we, we move on now. It's time to move on to Shelley. So thank you again, Paula. And then we, we get back with both of you at the end for the general discussion. Shelley? Okay, so I should share my screen, right? Yes, I would say so. Let's see, Let's see if this is right. Tell me if you see what you should see. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so Sheldon Goldstein uh, will talk about the distinction between uh, uh, past and future. Thank you, Shelley. Okay. Um, as you can see, my title is very original. It's just the name of this particular session. Um, and I think that'll go with, that will also correspond well to what I'm going to say, nothing terribly original. And in fact, um, It'll be kind of an opposite sort of talk to Paula's, very much just review, nothing too new. I just want to make a distinct, make a variety of distinctions concerning the dis question about the distinction between the past and future. But I would like to just um, congratulate Paula on her wonderful talk. That was a really great talk. Um, okay. So I'm going to, as I guess mentioned, I'm going to discuss a variety of topics about, uh, about time and its arrow. Some mathematical, some physical, some metaphysical. And I want to reformulate the title, the distinction between past and future is what I want to, what I will call the basic question. Is there a distinction between the past and the future? Okay, let's address that question. By the way, the question is in red. Um, there's an obvious answer. Obviously there's a distinction between past and future. It's one of the most 
familiar things to everybody. You have to be almost crazy to ask whether there's a distinction between the past and future. There's another answer, it depends. Depends, of course, on who you ask. You might get different answers depending on who you ask. But it also depends on something else. Depends on what the question means. We could vote on it, but I think it wouldn't, it wouldn't make any sense to vote on what you guys think is the answer to the question, is there a distinction between past and future? Because it is a bad question. It's too vague. To underline the, the vagueness or to at least relate to the vagueness a little bit, I want to rem remind you of a famous quote from Einstein, translated from the German. It's been translated a variety of ways. I think this is a fairly accurate translation. For us believing physicists, the distinction between past, present, and future is only an illusion, albeit a persistent one. This is something Einstein said quite just a bit, just before his death. And it's not entirely clear what he meant by this statement. What did Einstein mean by this? Well, one thing he could have meant was the past direction and the future direction, there's no fundamental difference between them. There's no fundamental arrow of time. But another possibility is suggested by his use, his reference to the present in this state. Present is also included. And so he could have had in mind that picture in which there is no special present, so there's no special future or special past, a block universe, we get four dimensional reality instead of a three dimensional reality that changes with time. Or perhaps he had something like both in mind. Probably probably the latter, I don't know. In any case, I'd like to analyze the basic question, to pin it down, to make it more precise. I wanna, and there's various distinctions on what the question might be, can be made along different dimensions. So I wanna mention the various dimensions and the distinctions in those dimensions. So basic four different dimensions here. We could ask about the issue of the arrow of time with respect to math. Do you have math in mind? Do you have physics in mind? Do you have metaphysics in mind? Or the question could be, are you, I can, with, with the ambiguity and the Einstein quote, do you have in mind the issue of the arrow of time or the pressure present or the special status of the present? Or third dimension, do you have in mind the fundamental level, the mic what you might call the microscopic level, or the human macroscopic or empirical level, corresponding to what we see? Big stuff. Or you have it could have in mind the fourth dimension. When you ask, is there an hour of time? Maybe the question is, is there a consistent hour of time? Is there uniformity in the hour of time or could it vary in some way or other? Let's start with the first dimension, math, physics, metaphysics. And let's start with math. So the math, the question is, what I wanna focus on is what does it mean and the level of math to have time reversal invariance, so there's no arrow, time reversal invariance. So we have a dynamic, some dynamical system whose state I'll call eta, and we have histories, eta of t, solutions to our dynamical equations. What does time reversal invariance then mean? It means that these solutions are invariant under the mapping changing t to minus t with some possible change of the state, eta to eta star, which is 
which should probably be an involution. So that if you ate a double star as 80, you do, you do this mapping twice, you get back where you started. So solutions are carried to solutions under this time reversal map. Usually, the, you do need to change the state. Eta star is usually not equal to eta with a time reversal, to have a time reversal invariant dynamics. Here's some familiar examples. Classical mechanics, where eta is just the configuration Q, the positions of the particles, together with their velocities. Time reverse that you have to change V to minus V. Classical electrodynamics, where you also have electric and magnetic fields. You have to change also B to my, the magnetic field to minus itself. In Bohmian mechanics, where I, I am using the conventional notation in Bohmian mechanics for the configuration of the act, is, is, is denoted by capital letter Q. Configuration for a system of particles is the state is the configuration together with the wave function, eta. Then the time reversal of that, to get the time reversal of that, you have to change the wave function, take its complex conjugate. What about quantum mechanics itself? Well, the question of quantum mechanics itself is not so clear, but it's not clear what you mean here by quantum mechanics itself. If you buy quantum mechanics itself, you mean just Schrodinger's equation, as many worldsers might say. Yeah, then eta is psi and psi, uh, and time reverse of psi becomes psi star. But with a more conventional understanding of quantum mechanics, where you have the collapse rule or something like it, or rules about measurement and observation, well, it's not even clear how to fit those measurement and observation rules, and even in the, in the dynamical scheme of the mathematics for a dynamical system, so that you can talk about it just being time reversal and varying. You're injecting elements, observations, uh, measurements, which themselves have an irreversible character. And related to that, you have collapse of the wave function, which definitely has an irreversible character. So with quantum mechanics, the question is, even though it's taken to be for granted that quantum mechanics is time reversal invariant by most physicists, it's not so clear what you even mean by the time, what you should mean by the time reversal invariance of quantum mechanics. It's often said that with stochastic dynamics, basically what I was talking about before was mainly, was really deterministic dynamics, a deterministic dynamical system. With, what if you have a stochastic dynamics, for example, a markup process? The common view is this is definitely not reversible, a common view, not reversible, not time reversal invariant. Why not? Well, because with the stochastic dynamics, you have a fixed past, it is what it is, but the, but the future is open. You need probabilities to talk about the future. I don't believe that's correct. We could just as well have a time reversal invariant stochastic dynamics. How so? You have to replace the solution set, which is supposed to be time reversal invariant, by a probability measure on path space, on histories. And that probability measure, then with that replacement, you speak about a, a reversible dynamics, stochastic dynamics, the reversal process as one in which that probability distribution is invariant when you take T to minus T. Usually in this case with stochastic dynamics with what are called reversible markup processes, you don't change the state eta. Eta and eta star are the same. For example, that's the case with the ornstein ulmek process, which is a Brownian motion and a harmonic oscillator potential. You have a probability distribution of paths related to a Gaussian probability measure, Maxwellian distribution. And when you look at the probability distribution of entire paths, 
you just and you run them in the opposite direction, you have, you have the same probability distribution. What about the physics of time reversal in there? The question for physics. What I was had in mind before, I just spoke about math. What about physics? Now you might be puzzled by that. Weren't the previous examples all physical? Well, yes, they were, because you know mathematicians like it's natural to study physical systems anyway, even from a purely mathematical point of view. But what physics adds to the question of time reversal invariance is that with physics you don't want to allow arbitrary involutions. Eta star can't change, can't be too different from eta. For physics, what distinguishes physics from math here is that in physics, we have a primitive ontology. What the physical theory is fundamentally about. For example, some ontology of local variables, as Belk would call it. Oh, for example, the primitive ontology could be the configuration, the positions of the particles in a system of particles. That would be the primitive ontology. That would be the those would be the most important variables. And then you might have auxiliary variables, which help provide a succinct, compact description of the dynamics. But the, what you really care about is the primitive ontology. So, for in this case, you you have eta is q and c, and you have a definite splitting of the variables in eta to those which belong to the primitive ontology, I'll call those Q, and those which are not in the primitive ontology, C. And then we demand that when we consider, when we do time reversal, when we change the state of the system, the primitive ontology doesn't change, only the stuff that is non-primitive. For example, V to minus B, B to minus B. Q is un should be unchanged by the time reversal. And so that's what I would mean by time reversal invariance, physical time reversal invariance, which we had in all the previous examples. But you could have mathematical time reversal invariance where you change everything. And you probably would not want to regard that as physical time reversal invariance. Now, here's the question of metaphysics. Even with a complete, even with complete physical time reversal invariance, no arrow at all, at all discernible in the mathematics, there could remain a fundamental, fundamental metaphysical difference between past and future directions. A difference that is not captured by the mathematical physical symmetry. Second dimension, arrow and present. I don't have too much to say about that. With regard to the arrow, the issue is, the question becomes the, the basic question. Is there an arrow of time breaking time reversal invariance in the physical or metaphysical sense? Present. Is there a special present, what exists, as opposed to a block universe? There could in fact be an arrow without a special present. You could have a block universe, which has an arrow, the future direction is different from the past direction, but there's nothing special about any present, past or future. It's just the directions are different. There could also be a special present without an arrow. That's a familiar situation. But could there be a special present without a metaphysical arrow? It's not so clear, but I think it's dubious. Third dimension. Fundamental micro level, the question could concern the fundamental, the basic question could be about the fundamental micro level or about the human macro empirical level. Concerning the existence of an arrow of time, are we concerned with the fundamental level? Well, generally, yes, that's what we are concerned with when we ask the question. Or the macro level? Well, presumably not, because 
how could anybody deny that there's an arrow on the macro level? I suspect you could find some physicists who would deny it. I don't think there'd be very many, but you know, with a good physics education, you, you learn how to believe the craziest things. Again, almost all would agree that there's a macro arrow given by the second law of thermodynamics. And just about everything else that we experience. But of course, that leads us to the notorious apparent conflict between fundamental micro reversibility and macro irreversibility that Paula spoke about. However, the resolution to this is well understood, I believe, along the lines Paula spoke about in her talk the Boltzmannian line, the entropic explanation, I think Paula called it a typicality explanation. I guess by entropic explanation, I mean the same thing as a typicality explanation. And as I say, this is well understood, I believe, at least insofar as the easy problem of reversibility is concerned. Paula spoke about the easy problem. That's what Boltzmann was most concerned about. That's where most of his work occurred. It's the problem of why does a gas in a box if it starts off in non-equilibrium with most of the particles on the left side of the box or the temperature, a temperature difference between the left and the right, why does, it, why does the gas go to an equilibrium situation, an equilibrium state where temperature and pressure and volume are, and um, density are more or less uniform? And I think that's pretty well understood. And Paula did a really good job of explaining why, why, how that's understood. And I'll just refute, repeat a few things with pictures and a few quotes. I like this Boltzmann quote. Whereas he, Boltzmann did not like Zermilo because he thought he raised a stupid objection. He shouldn't have raised it. He should have understood that it was not a good objection. Zermilo raised the objection of Poincaré recurrence. And so that a system can't really, starting in non-equilibrium with Poincaré recurrence, it never can go to equilibrium and stay there. It has to recur to return to non-equilibrium. So here's Boltzmann. Whereas Zermilo says that the number of states that finally lead to the Maxwellian state and I should add and stay there, is small compared to all possible states. I assert on the contrary, that by far the largest number of possible states are Maxwellian equilibrium, and that the number that deviate from the Maxwellian state is vanishingly small. Here's a picture illustrating that. The point of the picture on top, these two rectangles, the two rectangles are, not, are depictions of, let's say, the energy surface for a gas in a box. The picture on the left is supposed to be a really bad picture. The picture on the right, a better one. What's be depicted on both left and right is a partition of the energy surface into macrostates, regions which are macro, macroscopically similar, where the macro variables have more or less the same value. The picture on the left is crappy because the regions are of similar size. Whereas what typically happens with a gas in a box is one region is overwhelmingly dominant, the equilibrium region. Now the picture on the right is also very bad because the equilibrium is, region is so overwhelmingly dominant that it simply would not be visible in any realistic picture, which, ha which has the proper comparison of sizes between the different regions. Of course, that would make a picture very difficult. Some of the non-equilibrium stuff has to be visible in the picture. Systems in equilibrium are systems that, that are in the equilibrium whose microscopic state is in the equilibrium set, which is just about everything. The smallness of the 
atypical stuff, which means any, any non-equilibrium macro state, or the totality of them for that matter, is of order 10 to the minus 10 to the 20 for a gas in a box, maybe it should be 10 to the 23. For the universe, as Paula mentioned, according to Penrose, it should be 10 to the minus 10 to the 120 or something like that. This is small enough. Here's another picture which illustrates the entropic explanation of the easy, pro easy arrow of time problem. So I'm calling the macro variable here F. F for the, because that's the macro variable Boltzmann focused on within his fame with his Boltzmann equation. It's the F function of Boltzmann, F of Q and V, which is the empirical density in one particle phase space for the gas in the box. And there's one on the right, you see one very special point in the center, the equilibrium F corresponding to Maxwellian velocities, uniform distribution. And the Boltzmann and the arrows indicate how Boltzmann's equation and the actual dynamics in fact, takes you out from non-equilibrium to equilibrium, a very irreversible picture the irreversible looking picture. But if you ask what's going on on the fundamental level, this point in the center, there's a vast distortion in the picture. Our macroscopic point of view produces a vast distortion, which make equilibrium behave, go, convergence to equilibrium seem surprising. It's not at all surprising from the fundamental point of view, where that point of the cell, of, at the center is expanded to almost everything. So if you start anywhere else, you're just likely to end up at the center and stay there for most of the time. I think these pictures really are worth a thousand words. Now a longer quote from Boltzmann, which I think contained part of the previous quote. It's not such an easy quote, but I like it, so I'm gonna read it. One should not forget that the Maxwell distribution is not a state in which each mo molecule has a definite position and velocity, and which is thereby obtain, attained when the position and velocity of each molecule molecule approach these definite values asymptotically. It is in no way a special singular distribution like that point in the center, which is to be contrasted to infinitely many more non-Maxwellian distributions. Everything outside the center. Rather, it is characterized, now he's speaking about the fundamental level, rather it is characterized by the fact that by far the largest number of possible velocity distributions, that means configurations, not probability distributions, velocity configurations, have the characteristic properties of the Maxwellian distribution and have, and compared to these, there are only relatively small number of possible distributions that deviate significantly from Maxwell. Whereas Emile says that the number of states that finally lead to the Maxwellian state is small compared to all possible states. I assert on the contrary, that by far the largest number of possible states are Maxwellian and that the number that deviate from the Maxwellian state is vanishingly small. I think Boltzmann gave, despite all the controversy that does remain, a very convincing account of the easy problem of irreversibility of the arrow of time. Not the hard problem. Bottom line, there's no micro macro conflict for a gas in a box. But one can still ask, could there nonetheless be conflicting micro and macro arrows? When I said there's no conflict, you could have no, if we have microscopic reversibility, there's no microscopic arrow at all. That is not at all in conflict with having a macroscopic arrow. That's what Boltzmann showed. But you could still ask, could there actually be a microscopic arrow, which is nonetheless 
conflicts with the macroscopic arrow. That'd be kind of crazy situation, you think, might think. Well, there's a paper I did with Roderick Tumalka almost 20 years ago, who was concerned mainly with quantum mechanics and non-locality, but that's not my point here. The paper was opposite arrows of time can reconcile relativity and non-locality. And in this paper, we have a macroscopic arrow, which is in the direction of increasing time, but a microscopic arrow in the direction of decreasing time. Let me explain how there could be a microscopic, I don't want to describe the model, it's a bit complicated. How could there be a microscopic arrow in the direction of decreasing time? How do you, if you have a, if you have a breaking of time reversal invariance, so there's a difference between past and future, which, how do you say, what do you even say is the correct direction of the arrow? All you know is the directions are different. Well, in this particular model that Roddy and I came up with, there is a very natural sense in which the arrow is in the direction from future to past. Here's how. Let me first describe how the arrow could be in the direction from past to future. Obviously, if you understand it, how it could be from past to future, you, would un you could understand how it could be in the opposite direction. Just reverse everything. Here's how, from past to future. Suppose you have a dynamics where the present state does not determine the future state. If you wanna know what's happening in the future, you need to know a lot more of the past than just the present, maybe the whole past. But given the past, you have a natural rule which allows you to propagate towards the future. Then I would say, since the propagation naturally proceeds from past to future, at least the mathematical analysis of the dynamics must proceed from past to future, that you have a microscopic arrow from past to future. Now reverse that. You have a microscope so that if you want to know what happened in the past of the present, uh, if the past of time t, you need to know not just the state at time t, but the state at the future of time t. That will determine what happens in the past of time t, but not vice versa. So that you have a microscopic arrow which goes in the direction of decreasing t. Well, then how could the macroscopic arrow go in the opposite direction? Well, because the entropic explanation didn't much depend on the microscopic arrow. In fact, it didn't depend much on it at all. So put the low entropy initial condition in the past. If the low entropy initial condition is in the past, then entropy will be increasing from that past in the direction of increasing T. Conflicting with the microscopic arrow, which is in the direction of decreasing T. So you could have that kind of situation where you have a direct conflict between the arrows, but that wouldn't be a problem at all. You just have to be clear about which arrow you're talking about. Let me make a remark related to this. The entropic account of, macros of the macroscopic arrow really suggests the irrelevance of the microscopic arrow to macro irreversibility. I'm repeating myself, something I said a bit ago. Micro, the microscopic arrow had nothing to do with the Boltzmann analysis, the typicality analysis, the entropic analysis. This is particularly underlined by my paper with Roderick, to Moat with Roddy, because there you even had a microscopic arrow which is going in the wrong direction or the opposite direction from the macroscopic arrow. The final dimension, uniformity. Can you have an inhomogeneity, inhomogeneity in the arrow of time so that it goes, it's in one direction in one part of space and another direction in a different part of space, a spatial inhomogeneity. That's kind of tricky, maybe a bit problematical, maybe very problematical. Could you have a temporal, in, temporal inhomogeneity? That's what Paula spoke about. That was, the, I think the original idea for that was Carolyn Chen, Barbour, Kozlowski, and 
Mercari I should, I should have written as well. That's what pa pa Paula's talk was devoted to that particular issue, that particular resolution of the hard problem. Why, and if you who do have if you do have microscopic reversibility in the fundamental dynamics, where does this overall arrow of time come from in, in, on the macro level, on the cosmological level? That's the hard problem. One, one, one resolution of that suggested by Feynman was the past hypothesis. And as Carol, as um, Paula spoke, address the question of how you can understand the emergence of a macroscopic arrow of time without the assumption of a past hypothesis. Let me make a remark about a time function. Could be complexity as suggested by Barbour, maybe something else, whatever. Here I will raise a question. Is the specification of such a function, a time function, so here's my time function. Is this a definition, an axiom, or a theorem? It's often not clear. By definition, I mean, oh, that just defines it. Here, I, I specify this time function. That just defines what, what's the meaning, the meaning of time. I put that in red because I don't think I think it's, I, I think people, definitions are often abused and people make definitions where they are entire, in, entirely inappropriate. I think much more plausible is that it's either an axiom or a theorem. What do I mean by axiom? You specify this time function. Then the axiom says, ah, this function I just specified, this is the function which actually corresponds to let's say metaphysical time. That would be an extra axiom in physics. Or maybe it's a theorem. How could it be a theorem? The theorem would say that this particular time function has lots of nice properties. Most of those properties which, which we speak of, maybe all of the properties which we think of as time having to satisfy. Well, maybe it's a theorem. Related comment concerning transcendence. Suppose that fundamentally there is a complete time reversal symmetry in the math and physics for our world. No discernible arrow in the math of physics. What would that imply about the metaphysics? Well, I, I can, there are two possibilities, a natural possibility. There may well be no fundamental metaphysical arrow, but there may, there may in fact be one. It's not clear. To me, at least, it's not clear. Why is it not clear? Because reality can transcend physics. Physics doesn't capture everything, all there is to reality. The clearest example of that is consciousness. Physics doesn't capture consciousness. Not quite as clear, but it's certainly a possibility. Is it the metaphysical arrow of time? That's which would then be the most fundamental arrow is something that simply transcends mathematics and physics just like consciousness does. And with that, I think I'm finished. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Shelley. So, Again, there are people clapping on the on the chat. I don't, we can, I think, we can have both some uh, dedicated questions for you, or if there are, there is already general questions. I think we can start any 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 way. And uh, let me see. There is again Serge with a question. You can start. All right. Uh, so thanks a lot, both speakers, for very nice talks. Uh, I had a following question about the distinction that Shelley has made between the easy and the difficult problem of the era of time. Namely, I understand the easy problem very well. It's just that in our world, certain uh, processes always take place in one direction. Nobody has ever seen a gas in a room going back to the bottle where it was when I opened the bottle. So there is 
there are some mic macro macro variables which always change in one direction. For example, always in Greece. If I may, if I make the analogy for the difficult problem of the error time, what are those macro variables? What are the processes that always take place in one direction? Well, and what Paula spoke about, they didn't always take place in one direction. And at the, at the two sides of the Janus point, they go in opposite directions. When people, when people pose, a, pose the problem, yes, and there are a lot of people who are talking about cosmological problem of the error of time, uh, they, they try to resolve the apparent contradiction between the time reversibility of the microscopic law and what? What is the, what do they contradict to? I understand it perfectly in case of microsys, micro, uh, Mm, subsystems of the universe like gases but on a cosmological level i don't understand the problem quite well okay Maybe... so that's, you're making a good point there is the easy problem and the hard problem and one of the difficulties of the hard problem is it's not just that it's hard, maybe hard to solve, but it's hard to understand what it really is, which makes it maybe a super hard problem. But the question is, if in fact, physics captures most of what we care about, and on the most fundamental level, there's no arrow of time. How is there room for there to be an arrow of time in our experience? Our experience arises from the fundamental physics. There's no arrow there. Why is there this arrow? Well, you say, oh, that was taken care of by the easy problem. But yeah. that, there, there, without already, that just says, if you have a system which is um, not an equilibrium and proceed to the future, it'll go to the equilibrium. And in fact, the fact of the matter is, if you do the same kind of analysis you did to the past, for the past as you did for the future, it should have come from equilibrium not from a lower entropy past. So when you think more deeply about how systems got to these low entropy states to begin with, you find these are, you're pushed to the cosmological level as Feynman emphasized in, in his great paper, the distinction between past and future. Um, and that's what led Feynman to, to, to um, propose the past hypothesis. And, Discomfort with the past hypothesis, perhaps for a variety of reasons, is what leads to this Janus point picture that Paula spoke about. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Lev, nice to see you again, please. Um, uh, thank you for the talks. And uh, in fact, I have to. Uh, maybe two questions, maybe the first for Powell and then for Shelley. Uh, I remember uh, reading Lando Lifshitz about uh, death, uh, thermodynamic death, and then uh, he said, don't worry because cosmology solves this. The number, uh, the cosmology, gravity tell us that the number of states increases and uh, this explain uh, uh, why there is no term thermodynamic death. And I think this is a solution of a, the simple problem of Shelley. Um, is it exactly, uh, maybe this is what, what Shelley meant, then, or maybe at something else. So why, uh, because you, you mentioned so many uh, uh, approaches and some of them are pretty exotic. And uh, this one uh, for simple mind physicists has uh, solved, solved the problem. And seems it's supposed to answer this problem, this question. You and said the question is for Paula, um, but I, you said I mentioned many approaches. I, I don't. No, 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 no. Paula mentioned many, many approaches. No, okay. Not you. Okay. So you suppose, or you propose that somehow the state space increases? Yeah, so the, the space not, increases. Lando says so, no, not me. Huh. And I believe that uh, modern cosmology doesn't uh, contradict this, at least for now. Mm. Well, the way we thought about it, of course, I mean, we have infinite phase space from the beginning. No, no infinite, no, there is no, there is no the, reason. 
in the states which are accessed, so to say, well, the regions which are accessed increase. Uh, so maybe and this is may just infinity. There is no any reason to believe that the uh, world is infinite. Infinity is very complicated mathematical concept and uh, very large is good enough to explain on physics. So I don't think I don't think we need to go to infinity to, uh, to, to uh, all these problems with infinity doesn't sound physical, at least for me. And uh, Lando didn't consider anything. I don't, I, I don't know. I, I didn't, I couldn't what ask him. What about the measure then? I mean, the measure should be not non stationary from the beginning then. There's no, all this measure, all this thing, it's a technicality. I, if we have many particles, I understand the second law of thermodynamics. Just I don't need all this uh, fancy mathematics and all these things. Just I mean, statistical mechanics uh, tells me if I if I'll teach uh, ph uh, physics, uh, I can say there is no no Boltzmann, no everything. I just use statistical mechanics and I explain everything which I see in the room. I don't have any problem with uh, thermodynamics. I just say that I uh, a priori when I put something here. I, um, I, there are, I don't know what, what is the state. And then all this, uh, what you say, there are many, many states which are what you call typical. I don't, think else is, uh, I don't think physicists need any typicality. They just calculate and see how many, uh, how many states are close to uh, equilibrium and how many states are not. There is one important thing to understand. Uh, sometimes they say this uh, paradox of uh, why uh, entropy go up to the future, and not to, uh, to the past? But this is simply resolved by the idea that uh, it goes to the past. If I put this and somehow isolate the system, it will also go to the past. So there is now. So I, I don't think there is any this paradox, and I'm not sure that this is what uh, Shelley mentioned as a simple problem, which is resolved by uh, physicists. Uh, so I, I really. Every experiment on Earth in a room in laboratory can be very easily explained with statistical mechanics. And uh, with the assumption that I don't prepare any special state. To get some, something, I, uh, to get the uh, temperature go down, I need something extremely special. So telling that uh, if uh, nobody, nobody reported, my system is not really closed. And what comes from the outside is not, uh, uh, there is no any kind of uh, conspiracy. Then I explain everything which I see. I, I, I don't see why, why, on the big level, if there is no gravity and the universe is kind of doesn't change the number of states, then there is this paradox why we are not in thermodynamic death today. And then we can. Six about uh, we can try to play with fluctuations and other things, which seems to me exotic and unnecessary. Because cosmologists tell us that uh, we are not uh, the number, the, the universe, uh, what we see, uh, the galaxy, the, the, the total changes with, with time, uh, changes. So I, I really, and I don't see motivation from all this big uh, analysis uh, because um, we have to explain what happened on Earth. And, uh, and there is this change in cosmology. And uh, so I don't see a problem. Do you, do you think, Lev? Sure, Shelley, go ahead. What is your opinion about the past hypothesis? The, I think that it's very plausible what cosmologists tell me that once the universe was kind of small and there was a small number of states, and then uh, it in increases, so the number of states became bigger. So automatically there is this past, uh, past hypothesis, it's just cosmology. So fine, so you're saying that's just the initial condition. Yes. But the point, the question is whether or not, that's what um, Carol and Shen, what Barbara, what um, Paula spoke about. The question is whether or not you can, without imposing any past hypothesis at all, have it emerge from simply a dynamic with only totally reversible input. I think that you, I don't think you're appreciating the real question. By the way, with insofar as Landau and Lipschitz is concerned, well, they were really smart people. 
So maybe they were completely right, but I don't think what they said is clear enough to actually come to an understanding even of the easy problem for what they wrote. That's why after what they wrote, the, the, it, it, this remained controversial. And all the controversy about Boltzmann didn't go away with Landau and Lipschitz. Confusion still continued to prevail. Not because they were wrong, but I suspect because they were simply not clear enough. Though what they could have had in mind was exactly what Carroll proposed, the fact that with gravity, entropy is unbounded. But there, the non-normalizability of the measure is crucial. If the measure was not normalizable, what you would, should expect to tip our typical history of the universe is the system should be in equilibrium most of the time with, some, with rare fluctuations from equilibrium and with rarer, small, larger fluctuations from equilibrium and with rarer, rarer still, really large fluctuations from equilibrium. Something that Boltzmann once proposed and something that Feynman himself called ridiculous. Now, I'm sure, Lev, you don't understand why Feynman called it ridiculous, but, and it'd be hard to explain it right here, but have you read the Feynman on the hour, on the hour of time and the difference between past and future? No, but- I suggest very strongly that you do so, because you, I'm sure you admire Feynman. Okay, maybe I still, it's definitely, it's very plausible that I don't see, uh, Read I don't Feynman. see the problem which still exists. Read Feynman. But as a physicist, again, as a, you know, uh, I moved, uh, I'm really a physicist, but I'm uh, coming to all these philosophy talks and trying to go to philosophy because there are some problems which I think philosophy is necessary to solve. But this one, when I, uh, I taught uh, statistical mechanics, thermodynamics, and I couldn't understand why philosophers enter because I didn't see a problem. But Ph some philosophers maybe, enter, maybe, philosophers enter sometimes because physicists for peculiar reasons don't address the important questions. But what Paula spoke about was, was physics, it was not philosophy. Okay, maybe I shouldn't, uh, I, I asked you, wanted to you to, to clear up what uh, you mentioned by consciousness and um, because Look, Look, I know you, you, disagree. you, disagree. you, you disagree, disagree with what I said because you're a follower of Dennett, right? Yes, that Dennett. When I read Dennett, it seems, it seems correct. Well, that's another thing in which we have a fundamental disagreement. You do not think consciousness transcends physics, right? I believe that uh, universal wave function explains everything. Good. Function, so so everything it includes Consciousness include all my actions and my actions as there is this word consciousness, which people say that when people are conscious, maybe I'm too. And uh, so if I, I believe that if I can explain um, how my laptop works, if there is no difference, it's how to explain my, how I work. And uh, you probably will say that laptop does not have consciousness. I don't know whether the laptop has consciousness. What? what? I don't know whether it has consciousness. I suppose it would be considered a rather eccentric view to say that it does. Chalmers probably would, might, might, would once have said that it does, since it, or might, might very well, because Chalmers, as you know, famously said, maybe thermostats have a bit of consciousness. Oh, I completely agree. The electric kettle has, is a consciousness. It's a just extremely simple one. Okay. It has only two yeah. states of- Probably we shouldn't be arguing too much about consciousness. I think we can move on now. So thank you both. So there is Rodi next talking. Yeah, I have a, a, a remark on uh, uh, on Lev's first question. So that, that was uh, referring to uh, the Landau Lifshitz consideration uh, concerning uh, increasing number of states in phase space. Uh, uh, it seems that this picture kind of assumes like a background geometry of space-time and uh, uh, considers for phase space only the possible states of matter. But wouldn't it be natural when you consider uh, the phase space, that is the set of all physical possible states of the universe, then also to include the possible states 
of the uh, of the space-time geometry, let's say of the three geometry that is uh, of the possible three geometries associated with a certain um, space-like three-dimensional slice of space-time. And if you want to include that in to the possible states, as you presumably should when talking about the phase space of the universe, then wouldn't you conclude from that that the um, that the phase space of the universe doesn't actually change with time because the possible states are the same, and also you wouldn't say that uh, um, then as the um, um, as the uh, three geometry of space changes from time to time, that actually a phase space changes with time. So it seems that uh, uh, looked at in this way, um, uh, the consideration of Landau and Lifshitz also leads back to a consideration where you just have to consider a, a bigger phase space and they are presumably a non-normalizable measure on that. My understanding, First, my purpose is to explain what I see around now and uh, maybe kind of a reasonable uh, time span, history of time. If I understand what you consider, if you want to consider the universe for very long time, including maybe as an oldest city uh, expand and then go back, this is different scale. I'm, if, I, if we can understand this scale, what's happened now with us and a few thousand years before and after, and even much more, it's good enough. I don't need to consider a theoretical question about uh, uh, the geometry of the geometry will change when the gravity change significantly. So the big bank and then maybe the big death, if there is one big crunch, whatever. So, and if we want to explain physics, which we see around, I don't think we need to go to this. This is, uh, as, as I understand, would you agree that this is this consideration of it's not for the scale of our life? Maybe so, but I would uh, I would say that often we don't just want to explain laboratory experiments. We also uh, often ask about. Uh, what happened like millions of years ago before uh, before humans existed, before planet Earth existed. We want to discuss the formation of stars and of galaxies. And for that, we may uh, uh, want to apply considerations that uh, don't just apply to uh, experiments that have been prepared by human beings in a certain way. No, but this includes this. This is exactly what Landau's I probably had in mind and what I had in mind when I make a re remark. The history from a big bang from some time up to now explain what your considerations say, what will happen much later. And I don't care much. Look, uh, Lev, there's no reason, nobody is forcing you to worry about these questions. There are nonetheless legitimate questions, important questions. Not everybody has to be a physicist. Not every physicist has to worry about the foundations of quantum mechanics. Different strokes for different folks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Christian, please. Yeah. Uh, hi. So um, I'm not sure whether my question is maybe too technical, but or, or maybe too detailed. But you have to tell me if it is. Um, it's a question really about the easy explanation. So the easy part in Boltzmann's explanation. So, I mean, I think that in that explanation, there are still two parts, if I understand correctly. There is first of all, an aspect which is related to the typicality, which is what Shelley also have been stressing in the sense that equilibrium or the Maxwellians are like the overwhelming probable in the concerning where you are in phase space. And um, in that sense, um, it does not speak really, uh, I mean, it doesn't have anything to do almost with, uh, with the microscopic dynamics or with the microscopic arrow of time, except perhaps for what are the macroscopic observables that would define equilibrium. But there is a second part, which I think is also part of what could be called easy explanation. And that is more like in the transient regime, meaning that why would it be that you go to the more, the more probable state uh, which if you interpret this purely entropically. 
So if you would think anthropically, the natural, I mean, if there was no conspiracy, as the sentence goes, um, you expect that you move always to the more probable states, because on the most probable in the sense of the anthropic states, having the largest phase space volume. But there is, of course, a subtlety there, or which, has, which is rarely spoken about, especially um, because we often, for detailed explanations, we go to gases and we go to the Boltzmann equation and all that. And what I wanted to mention is the detail is in the boundary between the phase space volumes. I mean by the following that, you know, phase space volume on an intuitive level cannot be the whole answer in the terms of the dynamics evolution as time progresses. I mean, you would like to have, and that's the, where it gets more technical, you would like to have understanding why things now are not in equilibrium. What are the bonds on relaxation times? Why don't we relax immediately to equilibrium? I mean, why are we still here? I mean, if, if it is so overwhelmingly typical to be in equilibrium, why didn't we relax somehow much before? I mean, why, why is there not everywhere equilibrium? So in other words, it asks for relaxation times. And in other words, it asks what is beyond just considerations which are entropic? What is beyond just comparing phase space volumes? And the first thing that comes into mind is that even though your room is big uh, and your next room is even bigger, it may be that there are not enough doors or windows to pass through from one door to the other. And that I, I, some, I have never heard in this easy explanation of, of, the, of the arrow of time. And I wonder whether maybe I'm missing something or, or is that a point which deserves some attention or is it irrelevant? Because it's there you could think in the boundary aspect, it would seem that dynamics would matter a little bit. It, it's a point you don't hear about it because it's a detail which would take too much time to get into in, in the kind of talks. Here. I think Joel mentions this often though. Look, you're, I completely agree with what you said. Typicality on the level of mathematical physics is used on two levels. First of all, the most important insight was Boltzmann. That was what was discussed. Namely, that equilibrium is almost everything. In other words, equilibrium is typical. But suppose you want to show that a system converges to equilibrium. Then you've got some work to do. You've got some mathematics to do. You've got some theorems to prove, which will be very hard to prove. And the best we have, perhaps even now, is the Lamprey theorem, which is still only, in some sense, a partial result. But what kind of result is that? It's a typicality result. What does it say? That if you start off in a low entropy macro state, that for typical phase points in that low entry macro state, what you will see happen will be given by the proposed macroscopic equations, or the Boltzmann equation or whatever. Those are typicality results, but typicality there is being used in a much more detailed way than merely the simple observation that equilibrium is typical. I agree, I agree, but that does, not address the point of the transition between, I mean, somehow Boltzmann H theorem just is a deep fact. It's already very complicated for gases. I guess I can imagine that for even more complicated systems, it would even be more hard and, and would, would involve really detailed understanding of the dynamics to understand the transitions. And I'm not sure. Oh, about that, sure, but. I would be great to have results about that, but yeah, it would be even better if the results were stated in such a way that they were conceptually clear, which sometimes they are not even very good results. Yeah. By the way, the H theorem is itself, while well, when Boltzmann first proved it, it was just a, a result about a particular H function for a particular partial differential, well, for the Boltzmann equation, which is not exactly a partial di integral differential equation. But with Boltzmann's then understanding, let's say entropic understanding in terms of entropy, in terms of log of volume, that was what, that made it clear why the, there should be an H theorem because the increase, the, the decrease of the H for function correspond to the fact that correspond to going to regions of increasing much larger volume. So I even volumes, I, volume I mean, considerations there played a deep, provided a very important deeper understanding. But is that, so let me, be the, let me let me extremize my question. Is that not misleading? 
I mean, that fact for gases that phase space volume is playing such an enormous role, could that not be, well, misleading is too strong, surely, but only giving you part of the truth that this boundary effect, this accessibility between phase space volumes should play a role somewhere. Kinetic constraints, we know from, you know, like from spin glasses and all that, we have a Nobel Prize about it today. These are important things. I mean, they are not just volume considerations. No, of course, volume considerations are not everything, but they are a lot. Especially for gases. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say more than that. I would say the following though, sometimes volume, volume considerations are almost everything insofar as your question is concerned. A question is concerned. Suppose you have a, a, a demonstrably deterministic dynamics and you have some proposed Lyapunov function, which is supposed to increase or never decrease at least. If in fact that function corresponds to with the increase of that function would correspond to decreasing volume, then that could that then the dynamics that you're proposing, for which that is a Lyapunov function, can't be the correct dynamics because of Liouville's theorem. In, in a case like that, volume considerations are de determinative. Well, volume considerations, of course, enter very much in the, in Liouville. That that's some whole constraint that you have there. But I'm worried about relaxation times. I mean, what's, no, the, there's, what's there's, the heuristics? What's the heuristics of relaxation sure. times? The volume considerations are not everything. So one shouldn't too much eleve, elevate volume considerations beyond where they apply. But one shouldn't diminish them either. They're very important. OK, great. I mean, if I can comment or also, I, I think, I mean, what you get from the typicality of the equilibrium state, the way it is that it's almost of the entire phase space volume. And well, if you have such a state and if you have a stationary measure in your dynamics, I mean, then, well, you get that a typical trajectory spends almost all of its time in that state. And you get that starting from non-equilibrium, almost all trajectories, well, came from equilibrium and run into equilibrium soon after. I mean, I think that you already get quite a lot from typicality and stationarity. As these are strong concepts, I think. And going to the relaxation times, well, of course, that's much harder, but then you are much more into the details, of course. Yeah, that's what I'm interested in, relaxation times. And we saw in, in the proof of the Boltzmann equation that it's much harder to do really a mathematical rigorous proof about this. But maybe it's not in the matter of being rigorous, it's just the heuristics of the relaxation times I want to understand. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, my audio was off. So thank you, Chris. Dirk? Hey, thanks, Angelo. Yeah, first of all, again, Paula and Shelley, thank you very much for these nice talks. Um, I would like to come back, uh, if that's okay, to, to the topic that Lev uh, raised in the beginning. I, and, and I might want to add one comment, and in the end, I, I have a very general question. So, so first, my comment, my comment would be that uh, I think, um, thinking this way, that give me the initial conditions, and then I have the law, and I compute what, what the outcome or the prediction of my theory is, that is of course um, uh, okay, but there's one step that we always take for granted. And, and for example, if you think our uh, universe is Newtonian or quantum or, or whatever, um, we must realize that from the initial conditions that we would have to pick, you know, we almost know nothing. So, uh, um, so a statistical analysis is not just important for thermodynamics, but I think it's also important for understanding why one fundamental theory of the universe also applies to a subsystem of the universe. And I think this is probably another angle, uh, which is quite important also to the physicist to, for example, explain why there's a high probability that I throw a stone on Earth, I see a parabola, but there's uh, almost nothing I can tell if I flip a coin, uh, except that maybe half of the cases will be heads and half will be tails. 
So statistical analysis is, I think, the only connection that we have to nature. Even, even when we think on our laboratory table, we have everything under control. So that's just the, the, the comment uh, that I wanted to put, because I think that's maybe another aspect where statistical analysis is just important. And, and, and now the question is, of course, what is the probability measure that we can take then in the end to, to pick uh, our uncertainty or describe our uncertainty in our initial conditions that we don't know about? But maybe uh, the, the more general question that I would like to ask is, since I see in the audience uh, the mathematicians, philosophers, and, and, and physicists, maybe to both of you speakers, um, is there maybe uh, a good formulation of a problem why a physicist, a mathematician, and uh, a philosopher, philosophers should care about this problem of time and what in particular would uh, he or she have to solve in, in their area of expertise? So what would you would be your expectation what a, ph a philosopher should resolve? What's your expectation what a physicist should think about and resolve? And uh, likewise, also the mathematician. Last one is probably the most easiest one. Well, uh, Shelley, you? Uh, Paula, Paula, please. Well, I mean, first regarding the typicality, I mean, regarding the statistics in general, I think that um, for me, at least, I think that um, typicality explanations lie at the very bottom of any kind of explanation. So even for the, well, it's for the coin toss that we need to find some typicality explanation, but even for the, for the stone throw, I mean, eventually it's for typical initial conditions that the stone is flying in a parabola and not just some wind is coming and, and taking it away and something very strange is happening. So in the end, we always rely on typicality explanations. So that's, I think, why it is very important to, to really have a notion of typicality. And I mean, somehow maybe it is easy if you have a Newtonian theory when you have a stationary measure and you can somehow fix the notion of typicality to so such a measure. And then you have a time independent notion. It's already much more difficult in, in quantum mechanics where you have the wave function, which may itself be time dependent and you don't have a stationary measure in that sense. I mean, you have then Born's rule, but I mean, you have the equivariant measure as kind of a, well, the best you can do in that sense. Um, yeah, well, anyway, to have any kind of explanation in physics, you always need to rely on, on some kind of typical measure. Um, so I think this is also something which can be discussed by well, by everybody, by philosophers and physicists, and and in details also. I mean, you can for the mathematicians also. It is, I think, it is valuable to discuss like the derivation of the Boltzmann equation. We have only the very short proof, short time proof by Landford, and there is no other result than that. So I think there's still plenty of um, room to to go on. Yes, mathematicians. I suppose mathematicians probably should not be so concerned about the hard problem of irreversibility because that's a more conceptual problem and mathematicians will probably be more likely concerned with sharp mathematical questions. But there's certainly enough sharp mathematical questions to, to involved in proving theorems about convergence to equilibrium. We, we, we've proven based so, so little there. So, so, but these, the, what mathem, the more natural mathematical questions now are going to cons be concerned with the better developed parts of physics where they're less speculative, where they're sharp mathematical questions, which though it may be clear systems should be going to equilibrium, it's not mathematically clear and proofs are called for. I want to make one comment about something you said, uh, Dirk. It's of course true that, um, what we use probability because we, we have because of uncertainty. So we don't know what the actual state is. So we have to use a probability distribution. But we often use probability distributions when it has nothing, the issue has nothing to do with uncertainty. We have a certain dynamical system. 
We want to know what the solutions of what the histories are like. It's not as if we don't know what the right history is. It's, we're just talking about mathematics anyway now. Even in mathematics, there's no question of what is the actual history. All histories are there. But we want to know often what the typical history is like. Just like we often want to know what a typical large graph is like. So typicality is connected with universality, which provides deeper understanding, which has nothing to do with uncertainty. So you say this is another aspect. Yeah, but but I mean, I, I started, I started with my comment uh, because I had Lev's argument in mind um, that give me the initial conditions and I can compute the outcome. And uh, I think it's important to emphasize that there, I think very much it's quite apparent that we need to do an analysis on the uncertainties. So in order to to say that, like Paula has put it, the wind doesn't change really much. Yeah, well, on the cosmological level, the problem yeah. isn't probably so much uncertainties. You would like your theory to provide a, a history, a, a collection of uh, histories of the universe in which our universe, what we see, is not conspiratorial. That, yeah. you know, that's beyond uncertainty. That's just understanding. And if, if in fact, conspiracies are required in, in terms of the proposed laws, then you probably throw out those laws. Yeah, I very much agree. So I, I would put it even in, in the way that uh, basically our connection to the na to nature is is uh, basically just relative frequencies that we see in experiments, and the physical theory has to predict them in, in some kind of way. And there's one thing missing, and this is the uh, ignorance about the initial conditions. And, uh, and an analysis there is needed in order to uh, even infer a prediction about the relative frequencies that that we might see an experiment. But even without ignorance of the initial condition, you, you can still point out on the level of a mathematical analysis that just about all initial conditions yield those frequencies. Yes, I agree. Yes, not that I not, uh, don't agree. But I think so far, uh, both of you answered more the, the, the easy question what the mathematicians should do. Uh, that's usually easy if it's uh, if the question is formulated nicely. But what is your expectation towards the uh, philosophers? But here's something else mathematicians should do, and some are doing, Paul is doing it. Do a more, continue doing a systematic analysis of relational mathematics and physics. There's lots to do there. And there are a handful of people in the world working on it. And there's lots of interesting math there and interesting physics. And yeah, maybe interesting philosophy too. But there's still a, there's a lot of really important, interesting math there. I don't doubt that, but but I I think that that's understood. But in in the direction of philosophy and and physics, what would your expectations be, also, Paula? Or what would be? Oh, so far as philosophy is concerned, I guess the question is: What is the connection between our deep philosophical concerns? And, and, and the physics itself and the mathematics itself. And it's how, how well does the mathematics do justice to the philosophy? Well, I think there is, I mean, there is two issues here. I think one is, well, what is an explanation? And then you can really like have a philosophical discussion of typicality explanations in, in general. But the other thing, I think also what Shelley mentioned now, I think has to do with the conception of space and time, because when we talk about the era of time, and we already saw that at a cosmological level, so for the universe, we really have to rethink about what, what is time and what, what is space and what is the space of all possible states. So what is the universe? I mean, we have here deeper questions with, which I think one has, can still work a lot on that, both from the side of philosophers as well as mainly from the side of physicists and mathematicians, because I mean, like this group of shape dynamics people who really work on an approach which is an alternative so to GR and works with a different understanding of space and time. Well, I mean, I think these are deep problems both from philosophical and physical point of view. And well, I think that this question of re relationalism is not settled for at all. So I think there is still plenty of stuff one can 
really do. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And are there further questions? Well, if not, I think we can close it here for today. What do you think there? Yeah, I think that was a good first session already. So um, uh, we again, we have this monthly routine. Uh, we'll post the announcement probably one week early, like we did this time. Uh, have a look on the web page. Uh, we'll update uh, regularly there, uh, especially the titles and the abstracts. Yeah, we would be looking forward to seeing a couple of you or all of you <laughs> again next time. Okay, so we thank the speakers again, Paula and Shelley, and also people are uh, virtually uploading in the <laughs> in the list of participants. So many thanks to everybody. And then we'll see in one month, and you will receive, of course, email with the with the uh, notifications about that. All right. Have a good time. Till next time. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks to the speakers. Bye. Thanks to the organizers. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Bye-bye.